Hello and welcome to The Science Of. This is the series where we break down our favorite video games and put them under the microscope to examine the math and science behind them. Today, we are going to examine Slay the Spire. Without any further waiting, let's shuffle our cards and do some leg stretches because it's time to climb the science of Slay the Spire. Let's start off by looking at the size of the player characters. There's nothing to suggest any one character is larger than average. So for this video, we will assume the characters are of average size, which is roughly 5 feet 4 inches or so. From shortest to tallest, the main characters are as follows. The defect, or the blue character, the silent, or the green character, the ironclad, my favorite, the red character, and finally the watcher, the purple character. We should look at each character for any special quirks that might be out of proportion. To start, we should consider the length of the sword held by the ironclad. This sword appears to be a katana or something along those lines. The average length of a katana is about 24 to 32 inches, so nothing too out of the ordinary for the ironclad. Similarly, the silence appears to be mostly normal, except when you consider the use of their shivs. These exist in real life, but what doesn't make sense is how the silent has an endless supply. I know the silence is sneaky, but also who carries potentially hundreds of shivs on them at once? Moving on to the defect, everything is perfectly normal. Yep, perfectly, completely normal. Except for the fact that this character is a fully functioning AI robot. That's not normal at all. I imagine at some point we will have something like this, but currently with the technology we have, we have nothing even remotely close to this. But there's more for the defect. Mostly, I have an issue with the orbs that float over the defect. These floating orbs somehow contain and control the flow of lightning. This seems completely unfeasible with our current technology. For starters, lightning can be up to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. For comparison, that's roughly five times the heat of the surface of the sun. This leads me to wonder what exactly could contain the lightning. Well, in game, we know that tungsten is a real thing. So maybe some sort of tungsten container? No. Tungsten has a melting point of about 6200 degrees Fahrenheit. So close, but not quite. Turns out there's nothing on Earth that could survive not being melted if exposed to these kinds of temperatures. So whatever is in these floating orbs is something completely alien. The Watcher is also mostly normal, assuming we ignore her ability to sway emotions both for herself and for her enemies. I would say this is a bit out of the ordinary. I mean, sure, there are some drugs out there that can cause emotional swings, but nothing that works in the context of this character. I mean, we're talking about someone who just magics them to be mad and then calms them. I mean, I there's nothing that I'm aware of that you could do that with. <laughs> Moving on from the characters, and given what we know, we can use this information to determine the size of the room and ultimately and the height of the spire. If the player character is of average size, we can assume a room is roughly three times the height of the player. This leads us to guess that the height of the room is about 16 feet. For comparison, the average height of a ceiling can range anywhere from 8 to 10 feet. Since we know there is a total of 51 levels in the spire, we can determine the total height of the spire to be about 816 feet tall. For comparison, the spire stands taller than the Washington Monument, which is about 555 feet. However, the spire falls short of the Eiffel Tower, which is roughly 1,060 feet tall. What we once thought was an enormous spire in the sky turns out to be pretty average size, actually. Before moving on, let's consider one last fact. On average, there are about 21 stairs between floors in any given building. If we use this number, we can determine there are roughly 1,000 
71 total steps leading to the top of the spire. It's highly recommended you stretch before attempting to make this climb. With all that being said, we should consider there might be some sort of TARDIS situation going on with the spire. In the second tier specifically, in the background, we can see what looks like a fully lit up city on each level. Either those pocket cities are really small, or there's some magic shenanigans going on. Now that we've sized up the place, let's look at some of the inhabitants. Most enemies are of comparable size to the main player characters. There are a few that stand out that we should consider. Let's start by talking about the giant slime from the first tier. Despite being so large, the slime is slightly smaller than the player character, meaning that it's likely about five feet tall. With this, we can determine the slime's radius, assuming that it's a perfect circle. With some fancy math, we can roughly estimate the total volume of the slime is about 65 cubic feet. While this is interesting, let's put some weight to it. For the purposes of this example, we are going to assume the slime is similar in consistency to what we might call slime in the real world. Slime is basically just glue and baking powder. We can assume the green color doesn't add any weight. Now we get to the tricky part. Let's assume one ounce of glue weighs one ounce. There are eight ounces in a cup, and we have determined that there are roughly 7,779 cups in our 65 cubic feet of slime. This means in the end, we can roughly guess the slime boss is around 3,889 pounds. That's heavy. To put that into comparison, the average size of a car is about 4,100 pounds. So this slime is about the weight of a small car. That's a lot of slime. The slime is not the only boss we fight. Let's duke it out with the armored knight. The knight is slightly larger than the player character. And while this is interesting, I really want to know just how much weight that knight is carrying around. Let's say the knight is about a third larger than our player character. We should also consider that medieval knight armor weighs about 50 pounds on average. All of this combined would mean that the knight boss is wearing armor that weighs around 75 pounds. That's not as much as what I thought it would be, but what about the sword? Even at its heaviest, a sword wouldn't weigh more than five pounds. Meaning the knight's sword could come in at around seven to eight pounds. I used to think the knight was tough, but now I'm not so sure. Let's consider one last enemy before moving on. The giant statue head. While the knight may have been disappointing, surely this giant head statue has some true weight to throw around. Since the knight statue is laying on its side, we can roughly determine the width of the stone head to be around five to six feet across. We will assume the statue is roughly rounded, which means the stone head is about 113 cubic feet. Using the same information we learned from our Spelunky video, Limestone is good for stone carving. Additionally, a cubic foot of limestone weighs about 150 pounds. This means the giant stone head weighs in at around 16,950 pounds, or eight tons. If we break the game universe, this means the giant carving stones from Spelunky weigh nearly double what this stone head weighs. That aside, eight tons is no joke. We should also consider one final, final enemy. I know I said the final enemy, but we should consider one other one because this is kind of a special one, the heart. This massive enemy is the last boss you will face after collecting the three colored keys. All this talk about size has got me wondering, how does the heart compare? Well, an average human heart is about five inches by 3.5 inches. The heart in game is roughly twice as tall as the main player character. For some clean math, let's say the heart is about 10 feet tall by seven feet across. That works out to about 24 times the normal size of a human heart. 
Using the same math, we can determine the weight of the heart in the top of the spire is about 15 pounds. Not exactly what I was expecting, but still pretty huge. If you're squeamish like me, you may want to look away for a second because using all this math, we can now determine the massive heart is pumping about 31 gallons of blood per minute. Yuck. For a quick comparison, the average gas tank is about 15 gallons. Before anyone passes out on me, let's move on to the important stuff, the treasure. So let's put aside the enemies and focus on the real stuff, the treasure and the chests. I want to start with the chests just to mention, while the game depicts them as being various shapes and sizes, they tend to be around the height of about 2 feet. Let's expand this out and assume the dimensions are 2 feet tall by 3 feet wide by 2 feet deep. Using these numbers, we can quickly determine the volume is about 12 cubic feet. To give some perspective, the low end of a trunk space of a car is about 12 cubic feet. All this leads me to believe the chest and slay the spire are just giant rip-offs! All that space and you get one, maybe two relics if you're lucky? I think each chest should be stuffed full of gold! Speaking of gold, there is a way to determine the real value of the gold. This is a tough one because the only time gold really comes into play is when you visit the shop. I've pondered this a good bit and I think our best guess is going to have to consider that some of the relics are real items represented in the real world. I'm speaking of course of the various food items that you can collect such as strawberries, pears, and mangoes. These food items when collected generally increase your overall health. I'm not concerned about the their benefits per se, but I am very interested in knowing how much they cost in gold. Let's break down the shop prices and then we can go from there. Strawberry is a common relic and costs roughly 150 gold. The pear is like uncommon and costs around 250. And finally, the mango is about 300 gold. If we consider the average price of mango is about $1.50, then we can determine that the value of gold is a measly two gold per penny. Ouch. If we consider during my endless run of Slay the Spire, I made about 1300 gold coins. At the time, I thought I was as rich as I could be. But now with this new knowledge, turns out I only had about $65. That was about 10 to 12 hours worth of playing. Let's round out this video by examining some of the various relics that you can collect. Most are fairly normal, but there are a few that stand out that are worth mentioning. Let's start with the Anchor and the Captain's Wheel, both of which have similar effects of adding shields at the beginning of the round. However, I'm more interested in the practicality of these items. Both are fairly large, and seeing as how the characters don't appear to have backpacks, I wonder where exactly they store them. Let's assume that the anchor belongs to a smaller boat. If that is the case, the anchor in question could weigh anywhere from 5 to 25 pounds. Not too bad, but that's a lot to carry around. As for the captain's wheel, the size can also range from 12 inches to 48 inches. No matter the exact size, anything shaped like that would be difficult to carry around by hand. Think of all those stairs! One of the most valuable relics in the game is the membership card. There's nothing too crazy, as the card is simply a card. But considering when you have this item, everything in the shop is 50% off. It's like Black Friday all over again! These shopkeepers must be super generous, unlike the ones in Spelunky. I also want to point out the Philosopher's Stone, mainly because I immediately think of Harry Potter, but also because the stone in question doesn't exactly do as advertised. The quote-unquote real Philosopher's Stone is supposed to provide everlasting life and turn everything into gold. Normally, I would be excited about the extra gold, but considering the super low value of gold in-game universe, I'm more interested in the other properties. And finally, we will come to a close discussing one of the most interesting items in-game, the Lizard Tail. First off, why are we carrying around Lizard Tails, and where exactly did we get this tail? Second, how will having a lizard tail in your pocket protect you from dying? I completely get this as a reference to many lizards' ability to detach your tail and regrow it later, but it is certainly an odd practice. 
It's a wonder someone in this game universe hasn't started a lizard tail farm. Taking into consideration the value of gold, you could buy immortality for a dollar fifty. Now that's a pretty good deal if you ask me. With that fact, it is time to descend this tower and return safely home. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned some interesting facts about one of our favorite games, Slay the Spire. As always, I have enjoyed digging into the math behind these games. If you have any future suggestions, please let me know in the comments down below. But for now, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed everything. And I will see you guys in the next one. See ya!